Good morning, everyone. Today's message is on the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And I'm going to start out by reading from Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, describes what took place. It's in all four Gospels. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her foal. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Now this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and its foal. Then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. One of my favorite movies is Gladiator. Russell Crowe, Joaquin Phoenix, great acting in that movie. Uh, in the movie Gladiator, we have the story of an emperor who is very near death. He's got a young son who is completely immoral and wants to be his dad. I want to be the new emperor. And Maximus is a successful general whom the emperor trusts. And Maximus tells, uh, King Aurelius tells Maximus, you're going to be my regent while I return the rulership of Rome to Republican rule, to a Senate type rule, instead of a dictator. And upon hearing this, the son, getting this news from his father, kills his father and assumes command, and Maximus is reduced to the rank of slave, and eventually becomes a gladiator himself, and rises through the ranks with one goal, I want to avenge what Commodus, the evil son, did, because Commodus had Max's family killed. And Maximus wanted to get to that point where he could face Commodus and kill him, and indeed, at the end of the movie, that's exactly what does happen. One of the things that struck me in the movie was that Commodus was a person who did not have any real accomplishments of his own. He wanted the title without the accomplishments. And at one point, sometime after he had himself coronated, he came into the city of Rome. And the, uh, the scene in the movie is, is great. He's riding on a chariot. He's got a garland on his head. His older sister is right next to him. Uh, there are trumpets, there are percussionists playing, uh, the people are following him, uh, all kinds of flowers are raining down upon him, and a whole assembly of people is gathered. Uh, it's quite an announcement of the king entering the city. Now, by contrast, Jesus came into Jerusalem in a completely different way, didn't he? It doesn't sound at all like the scene I just described from the movie Gladiator. Jesus came in, the true king now, not just the king of Jerusalem, but the king of the whole world, the creator of the entire world, was riding into the city of Jerusalem on a colt, on not a donkey, but the foal of a donkey. And there weren't all kinds of armies with Jesus. There weren't heralds saying, wah, 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 wah. Jesus is coming, and so forth. Nothing like that. <laughs> Jesus was simply riding in, very humble. The people were receiving him gladly. The children intuitively knew who Jesus was. And Jesus referred to this. The Pharisees were indignant when they heard what the children had to say. How do you hear what these kids are saying? Shut them up. They shouldn't be saying things like that. And Jesus quoted from the Psalms and he said, haven't you read the scriptures, which was something to say, uh, a bold statement to make to the Pharisees because they were well versed in the scriptures and considered themselves the authority on such. And Jesus said, haven't you read that out of the mouths of babe, God has perfected praise. So let them say what they're going to say. The people, of course, welcomed Jesus with gladness and they laid palms down. Now, what, what's this about palms? I had to look this up. 
I've been going to church many years, and uh, palm branches on Easter Sunday, I mean the, the week before, and what does that mean? Well, the palm symbolized victory. It, it symbolized a couple of different victories. It was, uh, in one sense, it was the victory of spring over winter. We're, we're out of the cold season, we're into spring now. Uh, in another sense, it was the victory of Jesus over sin. Uh, it, it symbolizes military victories as well. In Greek games, uh, the, the victors, the, the winners of a given event, were, were, would be given garlands that would have palms on them. So the palm had a great significance. And of course, the people laid the palms down because they were saying, here is the victor. Here is the true king. Hosanna, which means save us, we pray. And the Pharisees, of course, knew that too. And they're watching all this. Um, and, and that brings us to the, the uh, occasion. Why is Jesus reading it, riding into Jerusalem? Well, it's Passover. It's the time of year when Jewish pilgrims from many different surrounding nations are coming into the city of Jerusalem. And they are coming there to worship, to be in the temple, to honor their God. Passover was a time when the population of Jerusalem would swell to two million people. <laughs> And it wasn't a city that could hold those that, that kind of number. People would come with their families. Uh, of course, they had to purchase the requisite sacrificial offering. You had to be there seven days before the Passover officially started to purify yourself. So there was a lot to it. There was a lot of downtime. Like, okay, we're here. It's going to be seven days, and we all got to hang together. And oh, you know, we got to, we got to buy some sacrifices. Oh, I don't have the right money. I got to get that changed. And of course, there were people, uh, merchants, ready to help with the changing of the money and the uh, sacrificial offering of the lamb or the doves or whatever it was that you had to buy. Um, and of course, these people were doing something that Jesus hated. They were making his father's house uh, a marketplace, uh, a den of thieves, Jesus called it. The money changers would do... Uh, inaccurate transactions so that whatever the amount of money that you had to turn in was, they wouldn't give you what it was really worth in the money that you needed to use. They gave you somewhat less and pocketed the difference. And then likewise on the, on the sale of the lamb or the dove or whatever the sacrificial offering was going to be, you paid exorbitantly for that too. And people knew this, but that's just the way it was in Jerusalem at that time. And Jesus didn't like this. And just as he had done at the beginning of his ministry, he did now also. He cleansed the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers. And he, uh, he said that zeal for my house commands that I do this. I cannot have this place be what you folks are making it. This is a house of prayer. And you're turning it into a den of thieves. And again, of course, uh, the Pharisees. What, by what authority are you doing this? Who are you that you think you can do these things? And Jesus, always, of course, quick with a quip, uh, far vastly, uh, his intelligence vastly exceeding the intelligence of anybody who would try to trip Jesus up. I can't even imagine having the, 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 the gall to that. I'm going to ask Jesus a question that he's going to not be able to answer. I uh, don't think so. I think Jesus will be more than able not only to answer you, but to put you in your place. And he did that several times over with the Pharisees. He said, well, let me ask you a question. What about John the Baptist, you know, my cousin, the guy who came before me and prepared the way for me? Uh, where was his baptism from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? And I love the way God explains it in the scriptures. He said, now, the Pharisees reasoned among themselves saying, well, if we say that uh, the baptism of John was from men, heaven, then Jesus is going to say to us, well, then why didn't you believe it since it had the divine stamp of authority? So we can't say that. But if we say that he just sort of made it up on his own, he was just some dude out there that decided to dress in camel hair and eat bugs and tell people to repent, the people are going to hate us because the people think that he was from God. So they looked at Jesus and they said, we don't know. <laughs> and of course they did know, but they didn't want to admit. And Jesus said, very well, you tell me nothing. And therefore I will not tell you either by what authority I'm doing what I'm doing. Jesus was the true king. And this first time around, that Jesus came 2,000 years ago, not as king, although he is the king, but he came as the suffering servant. He came to save his people from their sins. 
And these very same people that he was about to die for that were lauding him and praising him and saying, Hosanna to the son of David and so forth. Within a week, these same people were going to be calling for his crucifixion and death. It's, it's almost, it, it's, it's mind boggling to think that that could happen. But Jesus was not interested in popularity. He wasn't interested in being a politician and, and uh, staying in the seat of power for as long as I can. He had a mission to do. He was there for one purpose, to die for the sins of mankind. And along the way, to explain what the kingdom of heaven is like and how citizens of the kingdom should live in that kingdom. What should, what should we be doing? What kind of uh, works should those people who believe in Jesus' name be doing? So, I'm going to wrap this up real soon because we have limited time. But I've explained already that uh, Jesus was not confounded by the things the Pharisees said about his uh, authority to do things. He told a couple of other parables where he indicated that the Pharisees themselves were the initial, the Jewish people were the recipients. They were supposed to be the recipients of God's blessing. And God freely offered it to them. But they wouldn't take it. In the parable of the two sons, Jesus talks about how a father calls his two sons before him and says, Lads, I need you to work today in the vineyard for me. Who's ready? How about you, son number one? And the first son says, No, I'm not going to do it. But later he thought about that and thought, I really should do it. And so he went and he worked in the vineyard. The second son came forth. You know, the younger one maybe was looking to curry favor with dad and whatever. What about you, son number two? What do you say? Yeah, I'm ready, Dad. I'm going to go. But then as soon as father was out of sight, he slunk off. I'm not going to work in the vineyard. I just said that to make it sound good. And Jesus said, which of these two sons did the father's will? And even the little children do. The first one. That's right. Even though initially the first one said, no, I'm not going to do it. He relented. He thought about it and knew that the right thing to do was to work as dad asked me. And Jesus explained that you Pharisees, you're the ones that I'm referring to. The kingdom of heaven is shut up to you because you're like son number two that said yes to God, but I'm not going to do what God wants. And he said that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to get into heaven before you will. Because although initially they didn't want God shining his light on their deeds, Upon having that light shine on them, they looked inward and realized, I need saving. Yes, I'm going to say yes to God. And that was it. The switch gets turned on for them. I'm going to heaven now. But you Pharisees that think that you're already okay, you're not going. Because you think you're okay. That's the problem. Your pride and your self-evaluation, your high morality that you suppose you have, is going to keep you from getting into the kingdom of heaven. They tried to trip him up with one or two more things. There was a political ploy. Hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar? They were trying to trip him up again because the idea was they were hoping that Jesus would say, you know, knowing how oppressed the people were, no, you shouldn't pay everything. Uh, you know, I understand what you're going through and maybe you need to uh, hold some of the money back and whatever. But, of course, Jesus came back with, give me a coin, bring the coin that is used to pay the tax. And they brought him a coin. Whose inscription is on this coin? And they said, Caesar. And Jesus said, then render unto Caesar the things that belong to him, but render unto God the things that belong to him. And once again, the Pharisees had no answer for this. Jesus couldn't be tripped up, and, and how could you trip him up? He's the rightful king, the creator of all that is. It says in Philippians, and Wayne read this to us earlier, that Jesus, though he was in the very nature, the same as God, I and the Father are one. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Even though that was true of him, he descended lower than the Father, lower than the angels, became a man, became a servant, lowered himself to death, and even death on a cross, which was the most shameful death that you could go through, reserved for only the vilest of criminals. Jesus was willing to go that low, and because he went that low, God raised him up so high. It says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth. Satan's going to confess one day too, Jesus, you are Lord. 
He won't say it now, but he'll say it then. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus came first as the Savior, the suffering servant. But when he comes again, and that's coming, that's yet future. But there is a time when Jesus will be coming back. Only when he comes back, it will not be the same as he came the first time. He's going to be kind of like Commodus, except without the immorality. <laughs> he will be dressed regally. It says a sharp sword will issue forth from his mouth. He will destroy his enemies with flaming fire and take vengeance on those that do not obey the gospel. The king will be coming back as king. It's not time then to say, Oh, now I know who you are. Please save me. Yeah, you're a little late. <laughs> the time is now. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to call on the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you did come to this earth as a man to die for our sins. But we also thank you that you are heaven's king, that you have all power in heaven and on earth. And that you are a thought, you are Lord over all and have the keys of the kingdom, the keys of life, the keys of death. If there are any hearing this message who aren't sure about whether they are one of yours, Lord, I ask you to work on their hearts and minds and those of you listening that aren't sure. Make that decision today. Don't wait. Open up the Gospel of John. Read it. That's what I did many years ago. See who Jesus is and call on him and be saved. We ask you, Lord, to do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.